Welcome back to another installment of Space This Week. And this is looking to be one of the biggest episodes I've done in a long time because so much happened last week. We once again have lots of Starship progress to talk about as SpaceX prepares for Flight Test 4, as well as celebrate a major achievement made by SpaceX's Falcon 9, with Booster 1062 completing the first ever 20th launch and landing of a Falcon 9 first stage. In other news, United Launch Alliance retired its legendary Delta family with the final launch of Delta IV Heavy, NASA shared new footage of Europa Clipper and Artemis II's Orion spacecraft, Launcher conducted an extremely efficient engine test of their E2 engine, Roscosmos conducted the first ever launch of Angara A5 from the Vostochny Cosmodrome, and a whole lot more. Enjoy! Ship 29 is undergoing final preparations ahead of Starship Flight Test 4. It's completed all major tests, including a full duration static fire test, seen in this great drone shot from SpaceX. But right now, it's back at the production site. Interestingly, it recently had its nose cone tip heat shield tiles removed and replaced for somewhat unclear reasons. Ship 29's counterpart, Super Heavy Booster 11, is also back at the production area, undergoing its final checks, which will include the installation of its hot stage ring, among other things. It's not just the vehicles being ready for Flight 4, though. Last week saw workers removing and replacing a number of parts on Stage 0, the name SpaceX uses to refer to the Starship launch ground infrastructure. NASA Spaceflight's Boca Chica Gal captured the removal of one of the linkages from the launch mount. In fact, it appears all 20 linkages have been removed, as well as the clamps. It's really not clear why such a large number of parts are needing replacement, especially considering that you would assume they would be fairly well shielded during a launch. I'd love to know what SpaceX's reasoning behind this is, given that the end goal of Stage Zero is rapid reusability without the need for major refurbishment. We've also seen some pretty major works at the chopsticks. Firstly, the retraction of one of the actuators, which allow the chopsticks to open and close, followed by the actuator's pin removal, which was then followed by the removal of the entire actuator itself. We're not entirely certain of the reasoning behind this, but it's likely to facilitate upgrading the system so that the chopsticks can open and close faster. Later in the week, an apparently upgraded actuator was installed in the old one's place. This might not be a requirement for Flight 4, but according to Elon Musk, if Flight 4 is a success, or rather, if Booster 11 successfully soft lands in the Gulf of Mexico on target, then Flight 5 will see the first catch attempt of a super heavy by the tower, which will likely require the arms to quickly close around the booster before it ends up crashing into something important. <laughs> With the recent completion of Mega Bay 2, it looks like it's now in active service, as Ship 30 has taken up residence there. Unlike the High Bay, Mega Bay 2's door opens directly opposite the public highway, giving cameras a really great view inside, and in the case of Ship 30, it's pristine looking heat shield. The entrance to the production area though is quickly changing. As you can see in this shot from Sean Doherty, much of the site is becoming occluded by the rapid expansion of the Star Factory building, which is where individual ship components will be fabricated before they're stacked in the Mega and High Bays. Speaking of the ships, as you know, they're powered by three Raptor Sea Level optimized engines and three Raptor Vacuum optimized engines. And last week, SpaceX shared a slow motion video of a Raptor vacuum engine during a test fire. When they shared the footage, they highlighted that the engine's nozzle is sized for use by Starship in the Earth's upper atmosphere and outer space, so operation at sea level and low chamber pressures result in flow separation, creating those visible rings in the exhaust. SpaceX's Falcon 9 was no slouch last week, with three orbital launches taking place, one of which being, as mentioned in the video's intro, the first time a Falcon first stage was flown and landed for the 20th time. The first Falcon 9 launch of the week wasn't that one though, it was Wednesday's Starlink Group 6-48 launch, which lifted off from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, carrying 23 Starlink V2 satellites to low Earth orbit. The satellites were deployed successfully, and the Falcon's first stage touched down on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, marking just its second ever landing, meaning this is one of Falcon 9's newest boosters, and this was also the 295th overall landing for Falcon 9, so we'll be seeing SpaceX hit that big 300 number very soon. 
Another relatively new Falcon 9 booster supported last Thursday's USS F-62 mission. This was only its third flight overall, having previously supported two Starlink missions. The payload for this mission was the United States Space Force's weather system follow-on microwave space vehicle satellite, that really rolls off the tongue, the first of two designed to study the space environment. It was encapsulated into two flight-proven fairing halves the week before, which is the first time SpaceX has used flight-proven fairings for a national security payload. The payload was deployed successfully, here's the moment of deployment there, and the satellite's mass was relatively light and it only needed to reach low Earth orbit, so the Falcon 9 first stage had enough fuel to perform a full boost back burn back to land upon stage separation, making a successful descent and then eventual landing at landing zone 4 at the Vandenberg Space Force Base. The third and final Falcon 9 launch was the big one, the 20th launch of a single Falcon 9 first stage. It was poised for liftoff on Saturday with 23 Starlink satellites for Shell 6 on board, and there it goes, the 20th launch for Booster 1062. The satellites reached their target orbit successfully, and following stage separation, B-1062 made a successful landing on the assured fall of Gravitas drone ship, completing the first ever 20th launch and landing of a booster. Since its first mission in November 2020, this single first stage has launched eight astronauts and more than 500 satellites, totaling more than 261 metric tons to orbit in its three and a bit years of service. Its previous missions include GPS-3, Space Vehicles 04 and 05, Inspiration 4, Axiom 1, Nilesat 301, OneWeb 17, Arabsat BADR8, and now 13 Starlink missions. Speaking of Starlink, by the way, there was a total solar eclipse in North America last week, and while I'm sure you've now seen lots of videos of it from the ground, in fact a lot of you may well have seen it in person, have you seen what it looked like from space? Well, if you haven't, here you go! <laughs> SpaceX shared a view of the eclipse taken from one of their Starlink satellites in low Earth orbit. I don't have much else to add to this, but yeah, do all the satellites have cameras like this? Is there like some feed in some lab somewhere showing like 5,000 views of Earth all at once? Amazing to think about. Now, only tangentially related to space news, but I figured I'd include this in today's video, considering most of my audience are fans of Kerbal Space Program, and that is KSP1's original creator, Felipe Falange, aka Harvester, released his new game earlier today on Steam in early access, Kit Hack Model Club. Just putting the PSA out there, I have a full video of me playing the game coming out this Wednesday, and in it I have another chat with Felipe himself about its development, and we have some fun building planes, flying challenges, and trying out some rocket science as well. Make sure you're subscribed and ring the bell so you get notified of when the video comes out for this, I'm really happy with how it came out, so I'm looking forward to sharing it with you all. Anyway, uh, back to space news. United Launch Alliance's legendary Delta series of rockets, which have been in operation for some 64 years, finally retired for good last week, with the 16th and final ever launch of the Delta IV Heavy rocket last Tuesday. The triple core monster set itself on fire, as it always does, from Space Launch Complex 37 at Cape Canaveral before lifting off the pad. The reason for its characteristic fireball is because the hydrogen valves in the engines open before ignition takes place, so there's a couple of seconds where the hydrogen is just flowing free, and since it's lighter than air, it naturally rises up the sides of the rocket, and then, when ignition happens, the hydrogen ignites, creating that big flame that we've come to know and love, and I guess now we'll come to know and miss. Hmm. The payload was the Enrol 70 mission for the National Reconnaissance Office, and so given the fact that it's a national security payload, we don't really know anything about it. Godspeed, most metal of all rockets. Roscosmos attempted to launch their Angara A5 rocket from the Vostochny Cosmodrome for the first time last week. Until now, all other Angara flights have launched from Plesetska. This would be the A5's fourth orbital test flight. The first launch attempt was on the 9th of April, but this was aborted, so another attempt was made on the 10th. Once again though, we saw an abort. Finally though, however, on the 11th, all systems were good to go for launch, and when the countdown hit zero, the rocket lifted off successfully. It wasn't carrying payload, just a mass simulator, but it did reach its target, geosynchronous equatorial orbit, successfully. With the success of Angara's fourth flight, it shouldn't be too long before we see it enter operations, with the first real payload intended for the fourth quarter of this year. The Angara rocket family is designed to replace a number of aging Russian rockets, in particular the Proton series, and the Angara A5 that launched last week is capable of placing around 23 metric tons to low Earth orbit, or 5.4 tons to geostationary. 
Earlier today, a Long March 2D lifted off from China's Qiquan Satellite Launch Center, carrying the SuperView NEO 3-1 satellite to orbit. It's a remote sensing satellite that official sources state will provide commercial remote sensing data services for emerging scenarios such as digital agriculture, urban information modeling, and live 3D, as well as traditional fields including land surveying and mapping, disaster prevention and mitigation, and maritime monitoring. Last week, rocket manufacturer Launcher completed a three and a half minute engine test fire of their 3D printed E2 engine at NASA's Stennis Space Center. The engine runs on liquid oxygen and rocket grade kerosene, which usually burns with a yellow flame, like we see with SpaceX's Falcon 9 Merlin engines. But during this test, the engine had a bright blue plume. This is because it was running at incredibly high efficiency, with over 99% combustion efficiency in this test, according to Launcher. The yellow color from kerosene rocket engines is due to having a more fuel-rich exhaust, so less yellow and more blue means that more of the fuel is actually undergoing combustion. To summarize things very briefly, <laughs> the E2 engine produces 10 tons of thrust and Launcher markets it as the highest performing liquid rocket engine of any small launch vehicle worldwide, and if you're a budding rocket manufacturer in need of engines, then it's now available for purchase. We have some new footage of Artemis II's Orion spacecraft undergoing testing. Last week, NASA released this footage, originally recorded on the 4th of April, showing teams lifting the Orion spacecraft into a vacuum chamber inside the operations and checkout building at the Kennedy Space Center. Inside the chamber, the spacecraft will undergo electromagnetic compatibility and interference testing, or in other words, its electrical equipment and systems will be tested to make sure that they all work well together without causing problems in their surroundings. These problems could be things like electromagnetic interference, which can mess up how devices function or even damage them. Hopefully the spacecraft successfully completes this latest round of pre-launch testing, and we can get one step closer to finally seeing humans return to lunar orbit with Artemis 2. One of the most exciting future missions humankind has to look forward to is the Europa Clipper mission, slated to launch in October this year aboard a Falcon Heavy. Europa is the smallest of Jupiter's four Galilean moons and the sixth largest in the solar system. It's a really interesting place because there's strong evidence that beneath its icy surface is a global ocean of water, and scientists want to investigate whether or not this is an environment that could support extraterrestrial life. NASA is preparing a dedicated mission to Europa to investigate, called Europa Clipper, named so because it will study Europa extensively, but not from Europa orbit. You see, Jupiter's magnetosphere means that Europa orbit has very, very high radiation levels, which would adversely affect an orbiting spacecraft. Instead, the satellite will clip past Europa on 50 close flybys from a highly elliptical orbit around Jupiter. And last week, NASA shared new footage of the spacecraft in the High Bay 1 clean room at their Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and things are looking basically complete. They invited members of the news media to see the Europa Clipper spacecraft last Thursday, giving us lots of new views of the satellite. Europa Clipper is without a shadow of a doubt my most anticipated mission of 2024, and quite possibly for the entire 2020s decade. I really hope it's a success, and that we might finally be able to answer if Europa's oceans harbour life. Unfortunately, we will still have to be patient. While it might be launching this year, it won't arrive at Jupiter until 2030. Still, very excited to see this make progress. LAN Aerospace had another busy one last Saturday. Did you know that the famous Moon or Bust title screen in KSP-1 is an actual physical place you can visit in KSP-2, complete with crashed lander and sandcastle? Well, now you do. And in last week's KSP-2 outing, I went ahead and visited that site. If that sounds interesting to you, then there should now be a link to it on screen, as well as another of my videos picked for you by the algorithm, so hopefully it's good. <laughs> and of course, if you want to help support my work here, then joining my Patreon is a great way to do so, just like the people on the left did. But otherwise, that's it for today's episode of space this week i do hope you enjoyed it and i'll see you this wednesday for a very special video and then of course saturday for more kerbal enjoy